I remember um, that terror, right, you know, leading up to the election. Well, it wasn't even leading up to it because we were so certain Hillary Clinton was going to win. Yeah. Then those early days of like, oh, my God, Trump's the president. I think a lot of us were like, what is the world going to look like? But I think what this reveals is not only how hollow all of the um, hysteria around, you know, the right undermining democracy sounds when you have, you know, Hillary Clinton continuing to spy on her opponent, both as a candidate and then as president, you know, but also just how many of our institutions are on the Democratic side and seem to be sort of very much in league with that hysteria around the idea that an outsider like Trump was going to be president. Now, again, I felt that hysteria at the time. You know, I now I'm a little bit more skeptical of myself in those moments. But, you know, so if you have both sides feeling levels of hysteria about, you know, the other side's candidates and both sides doing things that undermine democracy, right? Trump is definitely doing that by suggesting that, you know, he didn't lose the 2020 election. Election. But, you know, one side is doing it with this aura of being so superior to the other side. So, you know, of the facts of the science and the side, you know, that side as well has all of the institutions on its side. So I think that's really important to point out. What, do you guys agree with me about that? For someone to say, give me money, give me support, give me your vote so that I can go to Washington. There are a lot of people who feel very strongly that certain changes need to be made, but not everybody has proven with their past experience, um, with their passion, with the work that they have already done organizing people, uh, with their work already. Take someone like Neil Walia in, in Colorado. He has worked in former Governor Hickenlooper's office on housing issues. He has worked with the National Governors, Asso Governors Association. But all of these people not only represent the kind of professional background, but also the kind of personal experience, which you know gives them the visceral understanding of what people are going through. Whether it has to do with Jason Call in Washington, whose own mother died because of issues with insurance companies she didn't receive the post-operative care that she should have received. Someone like Neil Walia, who I just mentioned, who for all of his experience, all of his education, still himself finds, him crushed, uh, finds himself crushed by college loan debt, unable to buy a house, uh, struggling with his wife, wondering should I have a child given the economic and environmental conditions uh, with which we are all faced. So they're all people who have a visceral understanding, not just from a place that's removed and buffered from the the suffering and the the real frustration and pain that people feel, but who actually sit themselves within a space that gives them the passion to go to Washington and make these changes. We have no more time. There are too many people who are shackled by economic and social conditions that are that are creating a kind of petri dish of rage that is very dangerous and unsustainable for our country. We need people who will go to Washington and make the changes on a policy level that will ameliorate some of this universal despair. In December of last year, two Starbucks locations in Buffalo, New York, filed to hold union elections. In just a few short months, over 90 Starbucks locations in over 20 states have done the same. Santa Cruz County, California, has become somewhat of an epicenter for organizing the movement, with three stores in the area moving towards unionization. Joseph Thompson, a barista at a Santa Cruz Starbucks location and student at UC Santa Cruz, go banana slugs, explained that they were that they were pushed to file a petition for unionization after a customer exposed himself to the Starbucks staff. The manager closed the store for only 20 minutes, then ordered the staff back to work. They join us now to discuss. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you so much. Thanks. Really appreciate you having me. Yeah, so tell us, what are, what are the efforts that are happening right now towards unionization? What are some of the roadblocks you're coming up against? A lot of the roadblocks right now is just people do not know what to do. And so our biggest issue is really educating people about how to organize and how to organize effectively. Um, you know, I'm an 18-year-old student at UC Santa Cruz. You know, I'm organizing workplaces across California now. And we need to really educate people how to build this movement and how to fight back against Starbucks' anti-union campaign and their union-busting tactics. So this week, Starbucks launched an anti-union website riddled with propaganda against unionization. The site claims to set the facts straight and answer frequently asked questions, saying, quote, we don't believe having a union will meaningfully change or solve the problems you've identified in your stores, and quote, every success we have ever achieved has been in direct partnership with one another, unquote. 
Uh, so, you know, what's, what's your response to that claim that the problems being identified uh, by the union won't be solved by a union? They weren't being solved by Starbucks to begin with, so I, I don't see how the union's going to hurt us. Um, and at the end of the day, like, we know our worth, and that's why Starbucks is launching this anti-union campaign and this union busting tactics, including the website. And, you know, if Starbucks truly thought that we would be negotiating less benefits and we would ne be negotiating, you know, a worse working conditions at our store, they would support the union because they know it would make it, you know, better pay for us. Um, and they would know that, you know, the union would be overall a good thing for them. But instead, you know, they're hiring this huge union busting firm, Littler Mendelssohn, to come into these stores, harass people, and really make sure that they feel insecure about themselves so that they vote no against the union. And that's what's creating this, you know, dichotomy between the baristas who are working and the upper corporate management who is deciding to, you know, hurt these breaches instead of helping them.